a Yankee-Boston game is different probably than any other game but the rest of the season. I know that when I'm sitting on the bench like last night and, and sometimes last year and we're playing the Red Sox, uh, I just get full of fury and, and I just want, I want to beat the ball club more than anything in the world, I guess. And I know that my time spent in Boston during the day in the hotel is thinking just primarily about beating the Boston Red Sox. So when you come to the park, it's, the park's electric. I mean, the people are really involved in the game, and that brings the players up to another level. It just seemed like it was just a natural built-in hate within one organization of one city hating another organization of another city. For years, that rivalry had built up. It's not the same now because you don't have the same personalities. You don't have Bill Lee calling Billy Martin a Nazi and all that sort of thing. But it just built up and built up, and right up to 78, it really got to be a feeling that this was one of the, the last of the old baseball rivalries, two teams that really do hate each other. God almighty, you can't imagine. It's like the South against the North. In the spring of 1978, the Yankees were preseason favorites to win their third straight pennant. But that didn't discourage the Boston Red Sox, a young team made up almost entirely of homegrown talent. I'm not a guy to predict uh, Eastern Division championships, but I know we're a hell of a ball club and we're going to be tough to beat. Don Zimmer's prediction wasn't as crazy as it sounded. The Red Sox came on strong in May and June. At one point, they won nine straight and were almost unbeatable at home. And in early July, they led the division by seven and a half games. We played well. We had an excellent offense that year. Our pitching was good. And, and we felt at the beginning of the season that we were going to have the type of team that could win a division and could win a pennant. Everything seemed to go well in the first part of the season. We played uh, excellent baseball, and nobody else was really playing that well, and it gave us a, a big lead. What Jim Rice was giving the Red Sox was the season of a lifetime, batting 315, smashing 46 homers, driving in 139 runs, and compiling 406 total bases, the most in four decades. The Yankees, meanwhile, were going nowhere. At one point or another, eight players were sidelined by injuries. In the span of 12 days, they lost four out of six games to the Red Sox, and by mid-July were in third place, 14 games out. To make matters worse, their celebrated feuding resulted in the suspension of their star player, Reggie Jackson, and one week later, July 24th, the resignation of Billy Martin. I would like to thank the Yankee management, the press, the news media, my coaches, my players, and most of all, The Yankees were now in the hands of Bob Lemon, whose easygoing style seemed to rub off on his new team. What had been despair was now hope. Bob came in and, and just kind of like calmed everybody down. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a tough period there for the club at, at one point during the year, and he's a very uh, quiet guy, and, and he just came in and just uh, told us, Look, you guys were world champions last year, just start playing like them. And uh, we got the people back healthy, and uh, the team played to the, the, its capability. Lemon inherited a team whose one constant all season had been Ron Guidry, and he was never more brilliant than on this night against the Angels. 17 strikeouts for Guidry in the ballgame. Crowd clapping on their feet, yelling... On that June night, Guidry reached the high point in a season that would stand as one of the greatest ever. In winning the Cy Young Award, he would go 25-3 with an ERA of 1.74. I've just been fortunate to uh, you know, be pitching well. I'm, uh, the ball's been going where I wanted to, and uh, it's not like you want to throw a ball inside and you throw it outside. Right now, everything is going my way, and uh, I'm just going to stay at, you know, in that group. Under Lemon, the Yankees started to turn things around. They got healthy again and once more resembled the team that had won the World Series the year before. Even a pair of losses to the Red Sox in early August, one, a 17-inning affair that had to be suspended, did not diminish their spirits. The thing that I think that helped us a lot was the fact that every time we play a different team, 
They would always tell us that Boston was still looking back at us. They were afraid of us, afraid of us getting hot and catching them. That was a little incentive for us to, uh, to keep going and to keep trying. And we felt if we got close enough to them to scare them, then we could catch them. In July, the Red Sox certainly looked catchable. They were beset by injuries, and their once comfortable lead was in jeopardy. And though they recovered, their 14-game lead was down to four when the two teams met in Boston for a showdown. Choke is not in my vocabulary. Uh, uh, slump is. If a guy goes in a slump and you're on a second division ball club, you never hear the word choke. But the minute you're fighting for a pennant and a guy goes into a slump, or a team goes into the slump, the team choked. I, I think that's ridiculous. You can tell when a team's choking. Uh, they look nervous, you know. They just lose their aggressiveness. They become pretty passive. And they don't say much. Uh, but that's not the atmosphere of this club. Maybe not, but the Red Sox completely fell apart against the Yankees. And what became known as the Boston Massacre, the Red Sox endured a four-game thrashing in which they committed 12 errors. When it was over, the Yankees had out-hit the Sox 67-21. to 21 and outscored them 42 to 9 and moved into a tie for first place. I'll never forget the, the way the players went about their business before that series. It was kind of spooky because everybody was serious, everybody was, you know, doing their work and it was almost like that feeling, we just knew we were going to win. We didn't do anything right. I mean, the Yankees came in knowing that they had to win. And they, they, they swept us. They, they really kicked our butts pretty good. We just played poor baseball. We made errors. We, we didn't hit. Uh, we didn't pitch. We didn't do anything right. So that was one of the turning points. If we'd have split right there, we still would have had a comfortable lead. It wasn't exactly a massacre the next weekend in New York. But the Yankees did take two out of three from the Red Sox to move two and a half games in front. But while the tide had definitely turned in New York's favor, the Sox didn't give up. They recovered their poise, and with the season about to exhaust itself, won eight in a row, 12 out of 14. After a while, you didn't feel that they were going to lose a game. Playing the kind of gritty baseball they had to do to get back in it, and also hoping somebody, somewhere along the line, are going to beat the New York Yankees, because the Yankees weren't losing too many. With the season down to the final weekend, the Yankees beat Cleveland in the first two games, while Boston was at home beating Toronto. Going into Sunday, the Yankees' margin was still one game, but they lost to the Indians that afternoon, which meant that a Red Sox victory back in Boston would put the two teams in a tie. That last game, every time a run would go up for Cleveland and a zero for the Yankees, the crowd would go crazy. So naturally, we'd turn around and check the scoreboard out ourselves. And we had our game pretty much under control. So uh, it was exciting. There's no question about it. Louis Tiant threw a masterful two-hitter against Toronto. And the regular season ended with the Red Sox and the Yankees tied at 99 wins and 63 losses. It would all be settled the next afternoon at Fenway. Park in Boston, and this is one for the money. All of it. The big bag of marbles. The second playoff game in the history of the American League, and the Boston Red Sox have been involved in them both. Marching back to 1948. And if there's anything else going on in this world today, I don't know what it is, because this is a baseball mad city, and you can imagine it's the same down in New York. The entire city was focused on that one game. Now, there might have been some people who were worried about the stock market or their houses or the insurance bills or something, but say so it just seemed that every person on the street was talking about the Red Sox and the Yankees and what do you think? And, and I think that they anticipated that they were about to, to sit in on history, which they were. The Red Sox pinned their hopes on Mike Torres, while the fate of the Yankees lay in the hands of Ron Guidry. In the bottom of the second, Carl Yastrzemski, the hero of September, hoped to get something started even with the elements working against him. Coming in that day, I said, there's only one way that you can hit a home run. You have to hit it down the right field line and wrap around that foul pole. Uh, anything going out towards the bullpen, the wind is just going to hold up. We have no score in the bottom of the second. That's gone. It's a home run if it stays fair. And a home run for Yastrzemski. The Red Sox lead one to nothing. Oh, he really put a charge into that one. 
it was nice to see him do that. And I kind of had a feeling sitting in the dugout that his jazz, you know, he's got the big hit, he's got the home run. Maybe this is our day, you know. But playing a lot of baseball games, you realize there's a lot more to go and a lot more is going to happen. Jim Rice added to Boston's lead in the sixth inning when he muscled a pitch from Guidry into center field, putting the Red Sox up two to nothing. One run was all the Sox could get, but they had a two-run lead with three innings to go. Against his former team, Torres was pitching brilliantly. Through six innings, he had a two-hitter. But in the top of the seventh, the Yankees started to stir. Base hit for Jamels as he goes the other way. Base hit for White. Jamels will hold at second base. With two outs and two on, Torres was now facing the ninth hitter in the Yankees lineup, Bucky Dent, with four home runs to date. Red Sox fans are terrible pessimists to begin with. And there's a tendency for Red Sox fans to say, who could be the worst guy to beat us and hit the ball out? So there were several people in the press box at the time, and I was thinking about it too. Bucky Dent is the most unlikely person. Fouled off his foot. It's one and one. There was a lot of joking going on when Dent fouled the ball off. It was just like Carbo in, in 75 before he hit his pinch hit home run. My concentration in that game, I had great, great concentration. I was throwing the ball where I wanted and I was throwing hard. And um, just that one three or four minute time that it took for him to do you know, after he fouled it because he was hobbling and hobbling. I just kind of got out of my rhythm and uh, a little bit of my concentration. Well, I was looking for a certain ball that I could drive because we had two guys on and, and I felt like, you know, that I was going to try and, and hit something hard and, and, and he threw the ball that, that I felt like, um, you know, was my pitch, a ball down and in. Deep to left. Yastrzemski will not get it. It's a home run. A three-run home run for Bucky Dent. The Yankees now lead it by a score of three to two. Bucky Dent has just hit his fifth home run of the year into the screen. And look at that Yankee bench, led by Bob Lemon. And a happy Bucky Dent. Watching Don Zimmer almost swallow his chewing tobacco probably, uh, you know, uh, epitomizes what really went on in, in the hearts of the Red Sox. It quieted things down here, but I didn't feel quite that badly because I knew the the ability of this team to to score runs and they did and they damn near pulled it off too the Red Sox got a rally going in the bottom of the eighth and when the Yankees brought in their ace reliever Goose Gossage to hold a five to three lead Boston kept battling Base hit. it stayed five to four and then in the bottom of the ninth, the Sox rallied again. We had one out and Burleson uh, got on first base. And I remember going to the plate saying to myself, the only thing I don't want to do in this situation is hit into a double play. Because I didn't want to end the game. Manila can't see the ball. And they hold the runner at second base. Lou could not see the ball. Forced his former head right at him. The play forced the Sox to hold Burleson at second in what proved to be a fatal decision because moments later, Rice's fly ball brought Burleson only as far as third base. Now with two outs and the tying run on third, all hopes rested with Yaz. And then on first and third, two outs, all I was thinking is base it to uh, right field, use the whole ground ball. I was heading to count 1-0. I was said to myself, the way his ball explodes up, that I have to make him bring something down and on the inside of the pot of plate to try to hit a ground ball for that hole. Uh, had the pitch exactly what I wanted, uh, I just couldn't get the head of the bat out there. Ball exploded on me. Popped up, that might be it. Nettles over at third base. He'll squeeze it and it's over. Yastrzemski fouls off the Yankee third baseman, Greg Nettles, and look at those Yankees. For Boston, an agonizing end. To walk into clubhouse and see grown men with tears in their eyes, and uh, I didn't want that because I wanted to tell them how proud I was of that club. It was pride and unbridled joy for the Yankees. If you believe and you play the game and, and you have the character that those guys have, that 
that uh, no matter how far behind, you can still do it.